today's seminar from the e-learning pedagogical support unit, EPSU. Broadening the horizons, knowledge gained, experiences shared, lessons learned from HKU's first MOOC, HKU 01X Academics. Um, today is basically an opportunity to celebrate everything that happened during that 10-week period of the course and the preparatory period before and the research and analysis period afterwards. So a great opportunity to celebrate what was a very positive experience. Five speakers for you today. First of all, Dr. Joseph Wu, as you can see, Associate Professor from the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics from the School of Public Health at the Lee Kashin Faculty of Medicine. Uh, Joe took the lead on the course Epidemics and today is going to speak about the professor's perspective. Our second speaker is Dr. Joe Kwan, also from the School of Public Health. And Chow will talk about the TA and the coordination perspective as well as the main coordinator of the course. Third, my colleague Dr. Jing Li Cheng from the EPSU, one of the instructional designers on the course, and he's going to speak about the design perspective, uh, sorry, the student's perspective. And after Jing Li, I will speak and I will talk about the design perspective from the, internet, from the instructional designer's point of view. And finally, Professor Ricky Kwok, Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning, the Chairman of the MOOC Working Group, and also the director of the e-learning pedagogical support unit, Ricky will share the institutional perspective and look forward to forthcoming Hong Kong moves. Okay, so without further ado, let me present you the first speaker, Joe. So hi everybody, thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm going to basically introduce to you what uh, academics MOOC is about what we did, how we did it, so on and so forth. Uh, as Darren has mentioned, I am the representative producer of this MOOC, but I'm but by no means the main effort. Uh, this is a huge amount of effort from many professors in our own faculty and also from overseas collaborators, as well as our, our staff in um, our school, helping to um, do a lot of things which I'm going to tell you about uh, to make this possible most notably Char um, here, who is, is basically my partner uh, for producing this book. So how many of you have actually taken this or have seen this um, before? Okay, so I'm not repeating myself to too many of you. Um, Epidemics is a 10-week book um, launched in September 2014, featuring um, different aspects of epidemics. Uh, our goal is to take the learners on a journey not only through the scientific principles of preventing infectious diseases, but also um, the public health actions. Because, as you know, uh, since 2003, actually since 1997, H5N1, we have experienced several uh, major events of epidemics, including SARS, including pandemic flu, so on and so forth. And um, quite a number of people in our faculty have extensive experience on both research and also translational uh, medicine. Uh, most notably, our dean, Dave Muller, who served uh, almost four years in the previous government administration as the um, undersecretary for food and health. Um, <clears throat> so, this was uh, Hong Kong U's first book uh, since uh, Hong Kong U pledged to join EDX in late 2013. Uh, the course was free to anyone, okay, just re register and then you can look at it. Uh, it's 10 week. Each week we have uh, one lecturer on a specific topic. The course was divided into four modules, basically talking about the origins, the um, spread, and then control of epidemics. And then finally, closed it with one week <coughs> on risk communication, um, facilitated and spearheaded by uh, Thomas Abraham from here in Hong Kong U. Uh, he used to be an editor in the SEMP. So he has a lot of experience of communicating public health signs and messages to the public. Um, and also some uh, kind of discussions between the faculty and also some guest speakers. So this is basically uh, what it looks like uh, for a weekly content. Uh, first, we have a one to two minute introduction of the topic of the week by, by the dean. And then uh, followed by 47 video lectures. Okay? Um, each of them is about 5 to 10 minutes long because that's pretty much the attention span or um, 
even of learners in, in, in the Moon universe. If it's longer than 10, it becomes um, a little bit too boring unless you are really uh, captivating. So that's, that's, um, that's from basically uh, common practice in the MOOC. Um, in terms of the um, discussion topic, because we want to, this is a MOOC, and we want to have some interactive elements, and one of the best ways to uh, engage learners is to give them a topic, let them discuss among themselves, and also uh, with you. Um, <clears throat> so each week we give a, um, a discussion topic for them to discuss. Uh, the TA, our team, uh, uh, we'll, we'll monitor you know, what has been going on, what are the essential uh, points that people are talking about, and then um, inform the lecturers you know, what, what is going on in the forum. And then at the end of the week, the lecturer of the week will give a response okay, to basically address the discussion topic from an expert's point of view. Uh, so we have talked about things like um, basic applications of the top material, as well as topical issues such as the bioethics of, say, engineering new viruses in order to study their properties. Um, and also, of course, Ebola, which has been the cost topic of public health uh, for 2014. Uh, we had quizzes, and we had, uh, as I said, discussion forums. So the quizzes, we tend to make it um, um, very easy, because epidemics by design is kind of like a documentary that you see in the CNN or BBC channel. Basically, you walk you through the very basic stuff, it'd be interesting, rather than going deep into the technical material. So this is quite um, simple. Um, so as I said, our goal is to not only talk about the scientific principles, but also the other actions to share our experience um, on past events and also current events of epidemics. Uh, these are the outcomes, which I'm not going to go through because I saw the slides from other people. Uh, colleagues from EPSU will brief you on the, uh, on the outcomes in terms of the metric. But briefly, we have about uh, over 10,000 people enrolled it, and about 12% of them actually complete the course with certificates. So these are the people, um, these are the breakdowns of the weekend themes. Um, I have, so I said that we also have collaborators from overseas to lecture in this, uh, in this group. Um, the two people were Mark Lipsic, who was a, who was a professor at Harvard, uh, my close collaborator. And also Dr. Mark Jitz from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, also one of our close collaborators in this field. Um, because this is because this was online use first MOOC, we want to make it as presentable as possible. And people were um, all of them were very enthusiastic and um, have very good track record in the sense that because this is the first MOOC on epidemics, and we actually do want to share with uh, the learners our best experience of public health. Uh, control for epidemics. So many of the speakers are the best, actually all of, all of the speakers from uh, the school are the best um, person in their field of research. So as we've mentioned, Epidemics was hosted on the edX platform. Uh, there are two main um, platforms at the moment for MOOC, edX and Coursera. So um, this was the ones that we, we went to. Um, Asynchronous learning means that people, as you would imagine, you enroll in the course and the course material are all on your cell phone or, or, or your account and you can look at it uh, at your own pace. So we, we don't require people to finish all the quizzes by the end of the week, um, so on and so forth. As long as you register, you basically are free to browse uh, all the material at your own pace. Um, this was a very new experience and rewarding experience for all of us. So for me, for example, I learned to um, think about from the learner perspective what, how we should design a course. If the course is something that you would um, look at you know, from your cell phone when you have five to ten minutes time, say, waiting for a bus or sitting on a subway or having lunch, you know, uh, how do you keep their attention? So to do that, we very purposely structure the lecture material to fit into those five to ten minutes bit and also say the absolutely necessary and the most concise in the most concise way. Um, in the lecture it's very it's very different from the lecture room because for example even as I'm standing here I can just talk spontaneously and then look at your reactions and then adjust continuously. Um, that's the natural way at least for me and for I think for most people um, Classroom setting. 
But because we have been giving lectures on these topics, uh, taking myself as, as an example, translating something that I would ordinarily give in classroom for a 60 minute lecture, when I actually condense it into, a, um, into something that is, I think, at the bare minimal and most necessary, uh, it will only you know, condense 95 to 10 minutes. So we purposely have to script it very, very carefully. We want everything that you said to be factually correct because you have no way of you know, correcting yourself. Um, and interesting and coherent um, because when you watch a video, there's no interaction. Okay, so that's one thing that we learned uh, and, and very rewarding. Um, and then the second for my again for myself is to uh, basically build a coherent story from different people. Different people have different working style. Uh, so the first is to kind of think, is to set up you know, an environment that people are most comfortable with. Um, giving their lecture uh, because this is a one single book. So we went with the model that um, we have you know, talking head on one side of the, of the screen and then overlay with some graphics um, um, and, and text. Um, <coughs> um, and this is basically trying to set a standard for the lecturers to, um, to give a coherent course. Uh, to set that up is actually not quite easy because People are not uh, very used to, uh, even for very experienced lecture, uh, professors, um, to look at a camera and then just talk. Okay, for me, it's, at, the, at the beginning stage, it was very difficult. I, I thought at the first time when I started doing this that I can just look at the camera and just talk as I am now talking in the classroom, but it actually didn't, it didn't work. So I had to script it and then, and then have some auto cue. Um, and then at the same time, colleagues remind me to smile more, you know, <laughs> so much as, so on and so forth. So all these are, 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 are new, you know, absolutely new, and that you wouldn't get in a classroom setting. <coughs> uh, and we also try to leverage as much as possible to uh, our existing network um, with other people in meeting experts in the world, basically, because again, uh, we um, want epidemics to be a good course on epidemics, so hoping to also engage other um, overseas experts in order to make epidemics more credible. So although this is a Hong Kong new thing, we want to make it not just you know, the best of Hong Kong new, but the best that we can do for the moment. So it was done, the whole thing was done in 12 months. Um, so these are the things that we, need to, we needed to do, design course curriculum and assessments. Um, sourcing for appropriate content. So as I mentioned, we went with a model that we were talking ahead, um, overlaying with some images and, and, and graphics. Those things are actually not trivial because we, uh, the book is going to be online, uh, basically visible to anybody who registers, so we are actually disseminating some materials. Um, in that sense, it's not something like um, you can pull a figure or something from a general article in a classroom and then you are typically fine because you are not really disseminating anything. You're showing it to your students. In the classroom setting, it's fine, but in the MOOC setting, it's probably problematic. For example, if I pull an image from the journal Nature, and if it's, uh, if, um, if it's not free, that could be a problem. I'm not saying that Nature would necessarily go after me for doing that, but you, you, know, you do that, you are susceptible to, uh, uh, to uh, infringement of intellectual <coughs> property. So we, Spend a lot of effort making sure that what we used uh, was um, copyright proper. And that took a lot of time because none of us were copyright um, experts. Uh, video assembly and editing, again, it takes a lot of new thinking from us because, again, this is the first time that we do it. Um, <clears throat> we really want to keep people interesting. So I can't have a talking head keep talking for you know, five minutes. That's not very interesting for most people. So every once in a while, you want some graphics. You know, Transiting back and forth with the talking head, such and such. Uh, coordinating them was a little bit challenging because, as I said, most people actually were my seniors. They were more established than myself in terms of their track of their research. Um, so, you know, um, coordinating you know, five chair professors is not an easy thing given their <laughs> different styles of presentation, their business schedules, you know, how important they think. Uh, the MOOC is such and such. 
Um, <coughs> but fortunately, we have good uh, support from uh, uh, junior staff, the TAs, and also um, staff helping us to do, helping me to do the uh, image sourcing, for example, video assembly, such and such. Um, <coughs> at the same time, we also have to um, liaise with edX people because um, it is once I have produced the course, we need to, for example, make sure that when it's actually delivered on the edX platform, is as error free as possible. So beta, things like beta testing and asking for edX, you know, what um, support you have, you know, what, what is the appropriate procedure before making it public. Uh, is also quite time consuming. And then finally, real time management. Um, as we have the course rollout, uh, for example, we need staff to monitor the discussion forum, make sure that we capture the essential points and, and um, let the lecturers know so he, he can respond to those points appropriately. And then finally, EPSU people, uh, colleagues, help us to summarize the learning's feedback, which is, of course, very, very important for us to know what we did right and what we did wrong, what was effective, what was not so effective, how to proceed as, uh, as we relaunch uh, uh, in, the, in the coming September. Um, so we deliver uh, on time and it seemed to be quite successful. So if, I think colleagues from UPS will let me know um, the comments, the feedback from the learners. Um, and again, it takes a lot of uh, collaborations and enthusiasm from the people involved. So it's, this is absolutely not a um, not a standalone effort from the school. Um, colleagues from EPSU, for example, oversee collaborators and junior staff. Um, they are all very, very important players in this um, in the production of this book. Um, publicity. So this is again another new dimension that I haven't really um, uh, it was new to me that you need to promote your course, uh, basically to everybody you know. So when we first ask addicts, you know, what do you do when you start to, when you have a, when you, how do you tell people that you have a MOOC coming out in the September? He basically said, you know, email everybody that you know. Email your alumni, email your previous students, email your friends, your collaborators, and ask them also to email other people that they know. Um, so hoping to, you know, kick this off uh, from, uh, uh, far away. And these are some of the things that we, we did. So we, um, we um, some newspapers were interviewing our team, uh, talking about not just academics, but basically the whole thing about MOOC. Uh, because TVB had a show on online learning. So featuring, uh, of course, is one of the recent examples. <clears throat> and finally, so I, I said that in in addition to regular lectures, we also have panel kind of discussions, thinking of things that we can leverage, um, not just existing network, but also upcoming events. So we have uh, Peter Piot, who is the director of the Women's for Public Health Lab of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He was the co-discoverer of the Ebola virus. He's also a very close collaborator of our SKU. He came to visit for a consortium in October, and we took that opportunity to ask him to feature in one of the panel kind of discussions on Ebola with Malik, who is the uh, uh, director of our school. Uh, and I think people appreciate that a lot because we have an authoritative figure talking about an ongoing event that everybody, uh, at least everybody who are taking um, epidemics is very interested in. We also had Dr. Thomas Sturdy, who used to be the former controller of the Center for Health Protection, to talk about his um, um, experience spending 10 years in CHP as, uh, as the controller, how he combat epidemics, how he communicates uh, risk uh, to, uh, to the public. So not from a scientific um, researcher point of view, but from a policymaker point of view. Um, so these are the things that we, we try to leverage in order to make epidemics as convincing uh, and as best and experienced to the learners as possible. So I'm going to skip this because these are just comments from learners that I think colleagues from UPSU will uh, I'm sure you've got lots of questions that you'd like to ask Joe, but as we have five speakers that we're trying to get in, I promise I will leave some time at the end for questions, but if we can have all the questions in like a dedicated Q&A section at the end, I think that would possibly be best. Okay. Right, our next speaker then, Dr. Chao Kwan, 
who's going to speak about the TA and the coordination experience. So uh, I'm just going to touch on some of the things that um, that you might like your TA for supporting staff to be able to. I won't repeat anything that Joe said because uh, he gave a very uh, good overview of the whole course. Um, but these are some of the things that you might want your supporting staff to be able to do. Um, so we had seven TAs supporting about a dozen uh, professors, um, mainly to assist with the video scripts and to do with the actual storyboarding from the slides that they typically using the lectures and converting it into a video format that they um, were happy to with. And to assist us, we had two IT staff uh, who worked on the images, the graphics, and taking the raw footage and making the first cuts, um, which we passed on to our uh, colleagues at Epson. Uh, and the key thing that we have to think about is uh, filming on location. So, uh, sort of things you wouldn't normally think about, but uh, we needed our colleagues to film in various locations, so uh, not just in the field, but whether we wanted a lecture theatre or a boardroom for a panel discussion, um, you really need to test these things beforehand. So you have a lot of problems. Uh, so simple things like the air conditioning here, you, know, you need that to be switched off, um, which won't always be controllable inside the room, so you need some advanced preparation and some real testing, because the sound quality is very, very important. Um, so just touch on the things we did before the course. So like I said, the main, one of the main things was video production. So storyboarding, the slides, and converting that into videos, and um, making the first edits. Um, a key thing that we do was sourcing material. Um, like Joe said, these are you know, permissions and licensing requirements. So having a good repository and finding a good source of images. So for us particularly, uh, in scientific um, imagery, we use a lot from the US CDC or US governmental agencies, which often have quite a public domain. But sometimes these weren't available, so we often use places like Wiki Commons and the car, uh, and sometimes even local places such as the Natural History Museum um, for images. And again, this you need to plan quite far in advance because a lot of them, places, these copyright holders, aren't quite familiar with the new concepts. So you need to explain to them, get the appropriate permission. Um, and the right terms and conditions. So these do take quite a long time. And finally, we also did the initial reviews of subtitles um, to the interest of our learners. Because it's quite a technical course, you do need people with a reasonable degree of knowledge um, in order to check the subtitles. Um, because otherwise, you can ask your professor or team to go through the hours of footage, which they do. But in the initial rough edits, it's a very important thing. With regards to the course content, um, obviously assisting the professors in terms of the assessments, the CQs, um, finding and helping find the meetings, but also again, this is uh, licensing permissions as well, um, with any particular readings from uh, journal articles. Um, one thing we did try as well was the discussion forums. Um, we would try and have a weekly topic for them to discuss which the professors came up with as well. And so apart from just a general forum, we also have a weekly actual discussion topic, which would encourage them. And the final thing you might think about wanting from your team members is uh, some people with some good uh, experience in marketing. Um, so things like, you know, we do get support from the external uh, relations. We have some colleagues here from the faculty and from the uh, campus with uh, external Publicity. Um, but you do need to update things on Facebook with help from FSU in terms of the video content. Um, also, you can try through LinkedIn and various other social networks. Um, and you do get quite a good response actually from given the nature of our course in uh, various global uh, public health forums. So, during the course, um, the one main task was looking after discussion forums. Um, we categorised our discussion forums into two parts, so the technical issues, which EPSU were very good at handling, and then the weekly groups. So we, in order to try and, because it's quite a long course, uh, 10 weeks, 
we try and separate forums into a weekly basis with a weekly discussion topic. Um, my audience, is, as you saw, was across the world, so that meant people posting all over you know, all times. Um, and if you have more than one TA to look after it, you might want to think about how you want to divide your time um, so that they don't overlap and not checking out the same comments and posts. So generally we split ours into morning and evening, so people would one half would check in the morning, one half would check in the evening. And this is a, you know, a seven day week process. Um, despite you know our checks with thousands of people looking there are going to find minor errors and corrections. Um, and there are going to be some disputes, misinterpretations of questions. So you might want to think about how you have a policy to agree with that, particularly with people who are uh, not happy with their marks, uh, not happy interpretations, so this is something that you might want to think about in advance. And the posts themselves, um, there are three functions. So one is in posts, so you can uh, put them at the top of the discussion forums or posts you think are particularly good, or for you know, staff posts, you can mark open, and you also need to read out some inappropriate posts, because this is an open global forum. You do get people, you know, selling rather dubious products and services on there as well. <laughs> and final tip I would say is that having a professor post, you know, even one or two, uh, or just you know, talking about readings, there's a very, very good response. And that is really, really appreciate having a professor post once or twice. It's not asking you for every day, but you know, once or twice on the week, it's very, very um, popular. And the other main task during the course was the uh, weekly Q&A sessions. So we would try and summarize some of the hot topics. Um, and again, this would also involve some video production, which is a very short turnaround time. Um, so again, things we did beforehand in terms of you know, the editing, audio, um, and the initial edits and the content sourcing are also very important during the course themselves. Okay, that's all. These are some things you might want to think about when you actually. Thank you very much, John. Okay, so up next is Jing Li, who's going to speak about the student experience. Everybody, Jing Li Cheng. Um, so, as you have heard, lots of people have done a lot of work on this project, right? So, from the faculty's perspective, and we have the TAs and EPSU, and, and we have a lot of other people behind the scene, like the communications office, you know, helping uh, promoting the course. So who, who are we doing this for? You know, we were expecting learners from around the world to take advantage of this course. So naturally, we're very interested in knowing who they are, where they come from, why they're interested in this course, you know, and they're going to do some work throughout the course and earn certificates. So what are they going to do, what are they going to do with their certificates, so on and so forth. And then also, very importantly, you know, MOOC offers a lot of opportunities for us to understand, you know, in this new way of teaching and learning, how effective are we and how can we be more effective? So lots of data that help, will help us to understand those questions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data that we have uh, analyzed and some of the kind of understanding we have drawn from that type of analysis. Joe, I think, had a slide, but he skipped over, skipped over, skipped over it pretty quickly about some of the information about our, our learners. So I'm going to just recite some of the numbers for you. So for this course, we had over 10,000 people registered for the course. Okay, and in the end, um, 1,200 people, a little more than 1,200 people completed the course and earned the certificates. Okay? So the first week of the course when we started, about three, over 3,000 people were very active, interacting and, you know, with the course content with each other on the course. And the last week, week 10, we had um, about 1,300 people active on the course. Okay? So, but if you look at the certificate rate, it's 10%, 10 over 10%. And uh, based on our, our statistics from edX, you know, typically these courses, these MOOCs, um, their completion rate, the course certificate rate is about 5%. So, you know, very cool, you know, good, good job, congratulations to the academics team on that. Um, 
And in terms of you know people who registered for this course, the top five countries or regions are as listed here: United States, Hong Kong, India, China, and United Kingdom. You know, we have uh, multiple ways to get an understanding of the questions that we, we want to know about our learners. So we have a, you know, an entrance survey and an exit survey, and uh, we have dashboard uh, from the edX platform to, to, um, to get some data, to get some understanding. And also, we have you know, all the back-end data that we can have access to. And Ricky and um, uh, his TA, uh, Xiangyu here, has done a lot of work in analyzing that, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, too. But this is from our entrance survey. We ask people, you know, how did you find out about this course? So naturally, um, you know, people found out a lot. Uh, a lot of people find out about the course through the edX platform and the edX emails. But also, you can see uh, our Hong Kong U self promotion also had some effect on that too. You know, we want to know why. Why are people interested in this course? Why do they, you know, spend time and take the course? Um, so some general interest in the topic, uh, to enhance my employment prospects, to earn a certificate for completing the course, and to increase my competitive, competitive, uh, competitiveness for entering college. So if you look at the population of the, uh, of the students who register for the course, you know, most of them, um, I, would say, I would say about 80% of them are working professionals. Uh, so they are between the age of you know, 20 to 40. Um, so lots of them have their... You know, master's degrees, some of them already have their bachelor's degrees, and some of them even have their doctoral degrees. So if you kind of relate that to, 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 to here, it makes some sense, right? So lots of them, they're just interested in continuing learning uh, about some areas of their own interest. So it's general interest in the topic. Um, you know, some people are interested in using this to enhance their employment prospects. I have a couple of statistics, statistics to share with you later on that too. But the course is conducted in English, so we wanted to have an understanding of uh, the comfort with the English language um, in terms of our learners. And we found out you know, most of them are either very comfortable or comfortable with the language that we use for teaching. So that's okay. Um, yeah, so how committed are they when they start the course? You know, are they just here to spend a little time, take a look, and then you know, maybe yes, maybe no, they'll stay with the course? So we asked that question in our entrance survey. Um, we found that, you know, from those who have responded to the entrance survey, about 2,600, half of them said they're very interested in doing, they're very committed to doing all the work and um, earning this certificate. So, as I said, we have an um, course exit survey. Right? So we wanted to get an understanding from those who have completed the course about their experience. So we have these major components in the course itself that are specifically designed, you know, as Joe was saying, for the purposes to achieve effectiveness of our teaching. So lecture videos, quizzes, readings, weekly roundups, um, forum discussions, so how useful are they for the learners to learn the content? And this is what they told us. Lecture videos you know, in, in terms of ranking, they're effective. Forum discussions, perhaps the least effective measure, but it's still a pretty, pretty good point. Uh, so, but that gives us, gives us information to look back at how we organize the forum discussion, you know, what are some of the things that we can do to improve in that area you know, in the next round when we offer the course again. Okay, so people earn a certificate, you know, what, what are they going to do with these? So, this tells us how people value the certificate as a result of their hard work in the course. Um, many of them said, again, well, the statistics here, one thing, one caveat is they, you know, we, have, we give people the opportunity to make multiple choices. This is not just one choice they make. Um, but many of them said they will, they will include the certificate on their resume. Uh, some of them said they will include on their, on their job performance review, so when they talk to their managers about you know, how they're how they are um, increasing or improving their professional competency, they would show, show this as, a, as, a, as, as evidence. To support job application, we do have some people say, um, you know, again, these are probably high school students, say they want to use the certificate to help with their uh, college application. So that's 17% there, so pretty large number, actually. Um, when looking at those who have completed the uh, 
course, and earned specifically. You know, we are also interested in, okay, so who are these people? You know, are there anything unique about these people that we can, we can get an understanding of? Um, so in terms of gender, there's a probably a pretty even distribution between male and female. And if you look at the grays of these, so when, when you see at the um, bottom, one, and then the end there is 0 0.5, so people need to earn, you need to earn 50% um, in order to pass the course on earn a certificate, right? It's a score of 50%. Um, what we get from this is, you know, from those who have earned the certificate, many of them are actually high score achievers, right? So if you look at the, the cluster on the, on the left here, many of them have achieved a score of more than 75%. Right, so these are, these are not people who just came here, you know, quickly make fifty percent uh, of the score. I mean, you know, just for the purpose of earning this. Okay, so they're really, really dedicated to um, complete the course and earn some, uh, you know, get a good grade. As I said earlier, we we have a lot of data, and then one one type of data is the kind of behind the scene, the platform provided data terms of how the learners interact with the course, with each other, and then we're utilizing some a couple of tools to help us underlap, un, um, utilize, uh, analyze that type of data. Um, I'm just going to share one example today. Okay, So this is um, something called uh, an event graph or C-graph. So on the, it's not quite clear, but on the, on the, on the top there, on the x-axis, um, there's the, there's a specific Video. So the course has you know, multiple video segments, right? So this is a specific video segment, one lecture, and it's about 10 minutes long, nine, minute, nine and a half minutes long. And this graph shows like how many people, how, how many people repeated viewing a certain segment within that video. So if you look at this, it's clear, uh, pretty clear there's a peak there at about uh, 1 minute and 30 to 2, two minutes and 30, uh, or 2 minute, 2 minute and 20 at that point. Lots of people stopped and you know, came back and then watched again and again. Right? So this offers us some insight into that. Um, compare that with the you know, video content itself. This offers good, a good opportunity for the instructor to look at the video and then just ask a question, you know, why do people repeat? This. this is what I intended for it, for it to be. So I'm going to show you very quickly that video segment, um, that little segment of this whole lecture video. Okay. So it's about a minute and 30. And this is where the lecture talks about, you know, uh, the instructor talks about a concept called phylogenetic analysis. Final genetic, uh, genetic, uh, phylogenetic tree. Um, it's pretty complicated. There right? are a number of computational methods to build a phylogenetic tree from genetic sequences, such as neighbor joining, maximum like search, and Bayesian inference. Let's go through the neighbor joining algorithm. We compare each pair of DNA sequences to compute their genetic distances. The two closest sequences are first joined. Their common genetic distance to the other sequences is to compute. Then the next two closest sequences are joined and the algorithm iterates until a complete tree is built by joining all the sequences. Right, so that was the about one minute. Segment in this video lecture. Did, did you get a good understanding? <laughs> if you're the learner, you probably would come back again and again. It, so it introduces a lot of very complicated concepts, you know, just in one short minute. So the instructor, maybe the next time around, you know, as the course we look at it, maybe we want to think about, okay, you know, learners are having difficulty here, right? It's obvious. Um, maybe we should expand on that, or maybe the instructor decides, you know, this is not so crucial for the whole. For the whole this whole video segment, maybe I'll remove it instead of, you know, instead of kicking it there, instead of it uh, makes the learners a bit um, confused or whatever, right? So this offers just a lot of very important and uh, useful information for the course team.
team and the instructors to look at their content and to understand you know, how can we improve the next time around. Okay. So like again, like I said again, you know, we don't have a lot of time to go through every detail of our analysis today. But hopefully, this offers you some some kind of um, understanding of what we can do with this sort of data, and then what kind of opportunities this can provide for us to, uh, to further understand the effectiveness of our teaching and learning. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Jing Lee. That's the student perspective. Now I want to give you a very brief run through of the instructional design, the design perspective. Myself, Jing Lee, and Nikki and Steve over here were the four instructional designers working on this course. Okay, so I just want you to give you a little insight into our perspective. To start with, I've got some numbers for you, or some subjects. Core team members on the epidemics course, that refers to the course team and the instructional design team and the video team. Beta testers. These are the volunteers who looked through the course before the students did on a weekly basis and basically looked through every question, every forum discussion to test that everything works out okay. So these are the people who tested the courses. We then have videos, assessment question items, discussion topics, and additional readings. So my first question to you is, on the right hand side you have a list of numbers. These numbers refer to the elements on the left hand side, but they're not in the correct order. Oh no. So first of all, how many core team members do you think there were? It's the instructional designers and the epidemics team and the video production team. How many? 24. 24, somebody said. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to give you 15 seconds with the people on your table. Try and match the numbers with the categories and there'll be a prize at the end for the table that scores the most points. Okay. <laughs> Okay, time's up. Right. I said 15 seconds. We have to be quick. You'll have to keep a record of how many each, how many you got correct. I don't have time to check them all. Okay. So, beta testers, how many? How many people did we have testing the course for us before it started? Ten. Okay. How many videos made up the epidemics course? Twelve. I wish. I was one of the people that sounded. Eighty-eight videos. Okay, so there are a total of 88 course videos. Uh, assessment question items? Beautiful. Discussion topics? 12. And 72 additional readings, so a special prize if you did all the additional readings on the course, there were a lot. And I have to say, all of these were open source. Correct me if I'm wrong, they were all open source. All open access readings, which I think was a fantastic job. There were many fantastic jobs by the people on the epidemics team, but the fact that this course produced so many open access readings, and I've witnessed other MOOCs where there are not, and the professors are not too bothered about that, whereas on this course they made a real effort to make the course open to everybody. Um, the teams that were included in the production of a MOOC, if we start at the top we've got faculty, so you've heard that there were I believe 11 professors and 7 assistants. Next came the video production team. The video production team for 90% of the preparation of this MOOC was one person, Jo. And along with, her, um, along with some of the assistants from the Faculty of Medicine who provided great service into the video input as well. Later the team expanded with, with um, Hans and also Pasha has joined now, so the team is bigger, but it was small at the time. Instructional designers, as I've said, there were four of us. Um, MOOC working group led by Professor Ricky Kwok, helping to support the whole process. We have lots of great publicity provided by our friends in CPAO, DAAO, also the Faculty of Medicine's own marketing team. So it's very, very, very much a team effort. And the teams are all working together to produce coherent e-learning, basically. I mean, a MOOC is an example of e-learning. And it's been argued that to produce coherent e-learning, you, you need a combination of content, pedagogical, and technological knowledge, of course. So the three areas of knowledge work together to produce effective and coherent e-learning. Of the three teams that were operating on a day-to-day -day basis preparing this course, which would be the uh, faculty, the video production team, and the instructional designers, 
I would argue that faculty are somewhere there on the Venn diagram. The video production team, VPT, the technology side, and the instructional designers kind of bridging pedagogy with technology. Certainly very, very, very little, or shall I say no, content input on this particular MOOC. It differs with other MOOCs. It differs with other MOOCs that we're currently working on, which I'll briefly share with you. But for the Epidemics MOOC, this was the situation. Okay. Now, if you think about the process, I'll give you a few seconds to read through, I think, what are the major stages in producing a MOOC. There are many stages in producing a MOOC, but I think these are the major stages in producing a MOOC. And for the Epidemics MOOC, these were the groups that took the lead roles. So first of all, deciding on the course outcomes and the structure of the course, the epidemics team had a very solid idea right from day one, with the course being divided into four major areas over 10 weeks, and they did not change that. Their vision stayed very constant, which was one of the reasons why the course was released on time and was a success. Medicine had a very, very clear idea of what they wanted, and the IDs helped in that role, so we were very much secondary. The learning and assessment activities, again, faculty led on this, and the instructional designers gave support. Basically, proofreading, suggesting rewriting of questions and things like that. Um, video and storyboarding and scripting was virtually, well, was all done by faculty. Everything that the instructional designers and the video production team did was reactive when we were making this particular MOOC. It's different with other MOOCs. Um, filming and editing. The video production team would do the first, the major part of the filming, then this would go to faculty who would make a rough edit and would then come back and would be worked on. I'll explain this process a little bit more right at the end. And the instructional designers would help with the sound editing. So that was the process here. Building and testing. Building very much the domain of the instructional designers and testing very much the domain of the beta testers I mentioned before. And finally, the running of the course, I would say, is a combination of faculty and instructional designers. Chow mentioned running the forums, basically, sorting out problems. These are the things that we do. And that leads into research, which goes then back. <laughs> the arrow is supposed to say research down the side. That's an omission. Then, then leads into research, which feeds back in. So these, this was the way that it happened for the course epidemics. But each course is different. Each group is different. There are different roles and responsibilities, different levels of expertise. Um, on this particular course, for example, there were 11, I believe, professors. On the philosophy course that we're currently filming, there's one professor, that's, so that's a big difference right from the start. Let me just remind myself which one I'm going to click on next. Architecture. Okay, as I said, it's different for other courses. For example, in architecture, the video and storyboard and scripting works very differently. Um, the videos, the storyboarding is done first of all by a member of the architecture faculty. And then the instructional designers work closely with the professor to iterate the script. So like six or seven iterations of the script are produced. And then it feeds back in to the video production process. So epidemics, as Joe told you before, was scripted. Okay? Architecture move is scripted as well. Philosophy is very different. Philosophy is not, the philosophy move that we're working on at the moment is not actually scripted. So I've added instructional designers and video production team to the video storyboarding. What's actually happening with the philosophy MOOC is the way that the professor, Professor Hansen, feels most comfortable is not reading from the script. Mm -hmm. So he's chosen not to read from the script. Lots of preparatory work beforehand that Joe mentioned about breaking lectures down into bite-sized chunks. And with philosophy, it's always a struggle to get them into bite-sized chunks. Um, we take big bites some of the time, but it's okay. Um, but Professor Hansen works best that way, so we actually didn't do storyboarding. The video production team did lots of work on setting a nice environment. That was the storyboarding, if you like, or pre-storyboarding was setting the environment. Then we filmed the professor on philosophy, and then that leads into the storyboard. Journalism and media studies, again, is a different example. They're very hands-on. Most of these things are actually being done by JMSC on their own at the moment for making sense of the news, another Hong Kong new move. So each MOOC needs different requirements and teams to work together. Instructional design takeaways. Um, choose a workflow and stick with it until you find a better one. You need to establish a workflow, you need to go with it, you need to try it, and you need to be flexible enough to modify it if it doesn't work. 
and most of the workflows we tried right at the beginning did not work first time. So if I just think of the final workflow for the majority of videos, let me see if I can get this right. First, so we said there were 88 videos, of which, say, 70 were course input, some of the others were reviews. For those 70 course input videos, the workflow in the end was faculty write the lectures, video production team films the lectures, it goes back to faculty who do their rough edit because they had somebody working with software. The first edit then goes to the video production team to make the next edit. This stage can go backwards and forwards many times, shall we say, sometimes maybe 20 edits on a video. Then it was passed over to me to do the sound engineering. It was then sent off to Zen Captions for subtitling. Subtitlings come back. One of the instructional designers does the first check, one of medicine does the second check, and we sign off. That's not the process we had right at the beginning when we started with the videos, it's nothing like that. So as I said, you need a process, but you have to be flexible. Second takeaway, beta testing is a must. Before the course, when I just started working on the course, I didn't even think about beta testing, it did not cross my mind. And then, I can't remember, two months before the course started, somebody said, we're gonna to need to beta test, and I said, yeah, of course, of course. As if it had always been forefront in my mind. I went home and said to my wife, thank God somebody suggested beta testing the course. You really need to do it. Because as many, we have four instructional designer pairs of eyes, and then the first beta tester looks at it and sees that, I don't know, we've spelled epidemics wrong. You need someone to test it. Be responsive and current during the course run. Um, Chow, I think, has pointed out that we had professors making comments on the forum. The learners loved it when the, when the professors went onto the forums and posted comments. They found that very useful. Um, we had weekly roundup videos where we could respond to the students as well. One of the great things about the course was week 10, which had the panel discussions, which were very current. We had, we had a real life epidemic happening during the course, which obviously, I'm not going to say is a positive thing, but it kept interest in the course. So it wasn't just a set of materials put online and forgotten about. We maintained uh, any interest in dialogue during the course. And my final takeaway, make the most of the learning process in various ways. I mean, I feel as though I, quite, I know quite a lot about epidemics now. And <laughs> philosophy, I'm actually thinking of becoming a philosophy um, professor in the future. I'm really enjoying that. Also, the interprofessional relationships that you can build, I don't think I would have got in any other job. So I've learned an awful lot from this experience as well. Okay? So these were the major four takeaways. I'm just going to use uh, about three minutes of your life uh, to uh, reflect a little bit upon the uh, lessons that we have learned. Uh, the title of today's seminar is about lessons that we learn in this process. And I, I've learned tons of lessons actually. Uh, so I'm just trying to focus on one bit, which is the uh, collaboration. Actually, uh, Jing Lee and Joe and everyone in the, in the team mentioned a little bit about that concept. I just try to reflect upon about the experience that I've gone through. But before I do that, I, I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank the whole team again, because I can't thank them enough right, to, to, to make this happen. Right? This, this is really a teamwork. And i also like to uh, thank all of you for your interest to, to this uh, project and showing up here because uh, you might not realize actually you are part of this venture. Why? Because we, we stick this uh, Hong Kong U logo uh, on, on the website, on the edX uh, course website. And we are all Hong Kong U uh, you know, employees and we work for the university. So we are part of this team, actually. You, you unknowingly actually uh, were draft into this. So I just want to warn you that, uh, check this out. Right? Uh, if you find anything you know, not looking good, let us know, because that's going to haunt you right, sometime down the line. Because we are facing the world when we do this. We are not teaching in the classroom anymore. We are teaching the world. So I, I, I like to first uh, 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 go all the way back, uh, maybe 10 months ago when I was, uh, you know, asked by, by the provost to, to coordinate this thing without any extra compensation. <laughs> but that's, that's a different story. I don't want to elaborate on that. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, our previous uh, 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 vice president, 
in teaching and learning step down, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, by accident. So he has to find someone to, to replace that role in, th in this particular book venture. And so I, I, I guess from this picture, you, you can sense the fear and, and loneliness <laughs> that, I, that I have gone through after I hang up uh, with the phone conversation with, with the Pogos. So how, how can I pull this off? This is really so new. Nobody in this university has done this. And, and of course, not me. I, 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 I'm just an engineering uh, teacher in the engineering faculty. I, I, I don't know much about this. I don't know why I was in this particular story. So this is really very scary. So what I did was, uh, obviously, the first thing I, I learned is uh, this is going to be a team effort. It's something that we need to collaborate. We need many of you to help. So what I did actually was basically running around, talking to people, uh, trying to convince them this is something that is uh, meaningful. Although I lied many times, actually, I, I didn't really know what I said is really true. I, I have to confess at this at this stage. Although now I can verify that this is pretty pretty much good. So run around on campus, uh, going to different places. <laughs> Uh, once I, I got this comment from Professor David Long, he, he uh, described me as really just a crazy person <laughs> running around for no reason, and doing something that is so new, and, and nobody really cared, actually. And I even went all the way to uh, Joe's office, <laughs> the medicine uh, campus, I, not on foot, I, I, I drove, I, I, I confess, but still, it's a long way. <laughs> And I keep doing this, it sound, sounded like uh, you know, Forrest Gump. <laughs> I keep doing this around the world, actually. When I got the chance to you know, uh, link up with uh, people also scratching their heads about what to do in their own institutions, I learned a lot and we share lots of experience and very strange things that happen. Coalition forms, friendship established. And these are real, genuine friendships. I'm serious here. Just like I, I have very good friendship with many of you in this room already. <laughs> so the, the idea is that we uh, use this project unknowingly as a vehicle to link up with many like-minded people around the world. Just to give you a few examples, uh, locally in, in Hong Kong, we are now collaborating with uh, UST and Chinese U Hong Kong on many things. A couple of things would be the, the so-called spots, which is to develop some kind of MOOCs that are restricted to a certain you know, selected audience. That's another story. And we also did a bit of research together. For example, the, the example that uh, Jane Lee showed at the end of his talk uh, was assisted by uh, USD people. We, we, don't, we don't have that capability here. We are building on that. But uh, this is something that is very exciting. Genuine collaboration, and we are also trying to collaborate with uh, you know mainland Chinese and Greater China, as you say, uh, partners like uh, Peking University and National Taiwan University on a on a MOOC in the future, and we also link up with uh, National University of Singapore on some collaborations uh, about uh, science of learning and scholarship of teaching and learning, and just to give you a heads up, uh, we will also have a meet up among all these friends in May, coming May, uh, to, to brainstorm about something that we have to do, in my opinion, the next phase of uh, using MOOC as a vehicle to benefit the campus, which is to think about how to learn from our experience to benefit on-campus teaching, like blended learning, flipped classroom, those kind of things. So how do we pull this off? Actually, we, we obviously need a crazy person, and that's me for the time being. I, I don't know whether I can find a replacement here. I hope I can. And we need to establish, as I said many times, a genuine relationship. We share the values, we work together, we try to build on top of expertise, we blend in different reading ingredients. So this is this talky guy here is me trying to serve food to make my friends happy. And these are you know, occasions that I, I try to make more friends, like uh, you know, on the top left corner, uh, you see uh, Benson Ye from National Taiwan University. This guy is 
a celebrity in uh, MOOC. He recently uh, won an award with, which, which people call the Oscar of e-learning. This is another story I will share with you if you are interested. And next to him is uh, Professor Li Xiaoming, is the assistant, vice, assistant president of Peking University. And other people in, in this picture are, you know, uh, friends from other institutions and so on. I don't want to waste too much of your time. So the impact of doing all this is uh, we have unprecedented outreach in all directions through doing this uh, MOOC project. And as I try my best to, uh, you know, convince you, uh, we have redefined the concept of team. Uh, by a team, we, we don't just mean, you know, the EPSU team, the medicine team, uh, but we also em embrace you guys, for example, in an institution and across institutions and internationally. Right? So this is something that uh, I didn't think about this before. And this is really an exciting outcome. And doing all this, help drive the university to derive a clear vision. Uh, this is something that I'm now doing. It's to hopefully convince the president and his team, right? uh, me not included, he has a very clear definition of his team, <coughs> to uh, consider e-learning, not just MOOC, as something that is strategic, right? trying to have an institutional position trying to reward people for doing this, right? trying to consider doing this kind of teaching and learning as innovations, pretty much like research articles that you publish, and so on and so forth. I don't know whether I can pull this off again, but I'm trying my best. Sustainability, and we have to keep it real, keep it up. We need to establish a new culture, which I'm doing now. And incentives, in my opinion, is the most important. Incentives come in two ways, in my opinion. One is coercive which is you know, tenure, promotion, things like that, that drive you to work on them, right? because that benefit you, and so on and so forth, which is not happening, to be honest with you, in a research university like us here. And persuasive right, is also useful. Right? If you see someone like Joe and his team has achieved, then you might want to do something similar. Right? So this is something that we will be doing right, uh, all the time for each and every of our courses down the line, so, have, so as to hopefully entice you to join us, to collaborate with us, and so on. So let's collaborate. This is my uh, final uh, message for you. 